I'm Artisha Moore, President and CEO of Association Forum. And today I have Dr. Ehrenfeld here with us. And I'm going to ask Dr. Ehrenfeld to introduce himself. Sure. Uh, my name is Jesse Ehrenfeld. I'm an anesthesiologist and also board certified in clinical informatics. And I'm the current president elect of the American Medical Association. I'm really excited for you to be here today. I have just a few questions so that our members and audience can get to know you. And as a association of associations, I'm always interested in hearing the leadership journey. So tell me a little bit about your journey to be the president elect of AMA. Well, uh, 21 years ago, as a first year medical student, um, I ventured uh, just a few minutes north of where I was in school in Chicago uh, to attend the uh, annual policymaking session of the AMA. Uh, and I remember walking into this ballroom uh, in downtown Chicago, seeing uh, the leaders of medicine, every state, every specialty, more than 190 um, individual organizations, societies representing um, uh, all that uh, represented American medicine and debating um, critical issues. Um, around regulatory frameworks, um, drug pricing, access to care, um, and I was instantly hooked. Um, and so I, uh, I was able to uh, work my way in as, as, a, as a voting delegate and participate in lots of different ways on committees um, and ultimately was elected into leadership and have the truly humbling privilege of uh, serving now as president-elect of the association. You know, that's very interesting, the, your uh, story. And I think for me, it's always about the business of heart as the membership and the organizations. And being a, a professional society person for 25 years, I'm always interested, again, not just how you got involved, but the impact. So how have associations and professional societies played a role in your career and in your life? Well, I, I wouldn't be in my uh, day job if it weren't for my work at the AMA. Um, and I currently live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm a senior associate dean and run the largest health philanthropy in the state. Um, I was hired into that role and I, I still see patients every, uh, every week um, because of a lot of the policy work um, and work trying to improve health outcomes for the nation. Um, the, the leadership at my medical school said, geez, we can put this guy to work um, and give him a portfolio where I can have impact. So um, the mentorship I've received, um, the leadership development opportunities, um, being able to get up in front of an audience and speak, um, those are things that uh, you don't necessarily learn in medical school, um, but the association side of the house has been critically important um, in my leadership journey. That's really interesting. And I think one of the questions that it made me think of is, you're very busy and you're still seeing patients and you're doing those things. How do you balance that volunteerism part with your professional and family life? I mean, that's a lot and you're still giving back. Well, and I've also got a three and a half year old that my husband and I have uh, at home, uh, two crazy rescue dogs. Um, and for 10 years I was serving in the Navy uh, while I was on the board of the AMA. Um, but I will tell you my, it, one of my mentors told me this and it, it took me a long time to really understand it um, and incorporate it into my life and professional portfolio is that you can have everything you want in life, just not all at the same time. And so um, it's hard to say no, it's hard to give things up. Um, and I, I loved serving in combat. I loved serving the Navy. I loved deploying to Afghanistan, uh, bringing um, my skills to military medicine uh, there are at least three guys that are home today that wouldn't have survived if I hadn't been there to provide them anesthesia care um, on the battlefield. Um, but I made a decision, we made a decision as a family um, for me to step away from that um, because they needed to make space for me to do other things, including obviously uh, take on more leadership roles within the AMA. Uh, as an Army grad, I grew up in the military. My dad is a military nurse. I, it is so much for me that resonates in giving back in that way. But then also being able to understand your calling and your family, right, and, and those needs. So I can understand that and appreciate that. As we kind of look at healthcare, and right now we all know that the global pandemic has really changed and created some unprecedented disruptions. As you take on the helm of the largest medical association in, in the U.S., 
What can you tell us about the future of healthcare and what groups like the AMA and others are doing to pave the way for that future? Well, you know, it's been a long two years um, and physicians have given everything um, to get our nation through the pandemic. Um, with the worst of it behind us, the AMA is now pivoting to think about how can we try to help create a recovery plan for America's physicians. Um, and that means trying to understand how do we support well-being for physicians and physician practices? How do we make sure that we um, remove regulatory burdens, expand telehealth access, um, ensure that we continue to have a focus on improving health equity around, around the nation? Um, those are critical issues that as we evolve into kind of the next phase of what healthcare delivery in America is going to look like that we'll be squarely focused on uh, for the next time period. And I'm optimistic. We have huge challenges ahead of us. Um, you know, you, you look around, you read the news and, and you, you know um, that this is a challenging time uh, in America. It's just a challenging time globally. Um, but I believe that our organizations, the AMA and the component societies have never been stronger. That I'm glad to hear another optimist. I too am optimistic. A lot of the challenges and the unprecedented pieces and things that you talked about, opportunities in the future, health equity and access and information, right, to be able to really empower, resonated, resonated deeply with me. And I think as we look at, at the association forum, one of the things that is on the forefront for us is diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's in everything that we do, creating the sense of belonging and really empowerment. So as I think about the diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, as we look at that in belonging, I'd like to invite you to speak a little bit about how DEI plays a role in your career, but then also advocacy for the LBGTQ plus community. How do we look at empowerment and how does that affect the AMA and their work? Well, it's, it's a critical issue and it's obviously deeply personal for me as, uh, as a gay physician. Um, and, you know, when I came out in college, I was 19. It was the year that Matthew Shepard was brutally murdered and left out in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming to die. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, what does this mean? to enter a profession in a society uh, where we tolerate that kind of hate. Um, and as I went into medical school and uh, training uh, and entered into the profession, um, there has been a lack of visible leaders, um, a lack of visible leaders um, that can carry the torch for health equity that has started to change. Um, I'm the first gay person to be elected to the AMA Board of Trustees to serve as an officer and in June I'll be the first gay president um, of the AMA in its 175 year, its 176 year history. Um, part of uh, what we have done through our Center for Health Equity um, is we released a strategic plan in, in 2021 um, that figures out how do we embed equity in everything we do. Um, and, and if folks are interested, it, it's, it's a download on our website. Um, it's a long document. Um, there's executive summaries so you can, you can get the gist of where we're driving towards pretty quickly. But importantly, in that document um, is an accounting of our missteps. There is a detailed accounting of all of the times when the AMA stood by and either actively or passively allowed discrimination to happen against black physicians against gay Americans, against minoritized populations. And we can't empower our members. We can't move forward as an association until we reconcile that history, until we understand where we've come from, acknowledge it, speak truth and move forward. And I'm so excited that we've been in a place as an organization where we're ready to do that. And I actually think that hopefully it will be a model for other associations. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that next week when we meet at the Healthcare Collaborative. But I will say for this video, as we in our community and other associations are, are looking at our charges, looking at taking our efforts to the next step, I really appreciate what you said about really accounting of the missteps. That's something that is so helpful 
when people acknowledge that we didn't get it right the first time because we usually are so braggadocious, like, look at what we did. So thank you for saying that. And I look forward, I'm going to be downloading. I look forward to digging in, not just the executive summary, all of it, because I want to learn and be able to help our organizations empower in the way that you all are doing. Absolutely. And I, I will tell you, approaching these issues as I do my clinical care with humility is so critical um, because we all suffer from the human condition and make mistakes as individuals and as organizations. Yes. Thank you for that. And thank you for this time with us. I look forward to seeing you in person next week. Thanks for uh, having the chat today uh, and can't wait to get together. Thank you.